my name is Phil Dundas. I'm the owner of the landscape company in town and the education director at the Central Coast chapter of the CLCA who's putting this event on today, the California Landscape Contractors Association. Um, and uh, we wanted to, you know, bring everybody together to talk about this issue. It's an important issue. Um, it's particularly relevant to our community. Uh, I think having the highest percentage of uh, people per capita that live in a high risk wildfire zone, um, our county is um, near and dear to this issue uh, as much as anyone. Um, we've had the worst fire season on record. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of loss of property and life. Um, and uh, we're starting to make some efforts around um, prevention and home hardening, which Firescape is a component of. And, you know, we'll have speakers, particularly Marco Mack, the Aptos La Selva um, uh, fire marshal, uh, about uh, steps you can take around the home. Um, and we want to bring basically to people's attention some of the, the resources that are available. So the agenda we have we have presented for you, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about firescaping and that focuses more specifically on the, the landscaping around the home. Uh, Martin Quigley, who's the executive director of the UCSC Arboretum, is going to talk specifically about plant selection um, and how we can incorporate that into creating more defensible space. Uh, then Marco Mack, the Aptos La Selva Fire Marshal, is going to talk about home hardening and some issues around, around uh, wildfire and the um, wildland urban interface. Uh, then Liz Croft, uh, one of the owners of Soul Property Advisors and the president of the Women's Council of Realtors, is going to talk about some insurance data and other information that's relevant to homeowners. Um, Ed Hayes is going to talk about the Fire Safety Council, which is a local organization which provides resources uh, for people around the wildfire issue, as well as Lynn Sestak. Um, he's going to talk about Firewise and how communities can come together to work together to you know, make, uh, make their, their space and communities a little safer. John Kern's going to talk briefly. He's a professor at Monterey Peninsula College, and he's offering a class on firescaping and has some very uh, impressive um, and credentialed speakers um, that are going to be part of his curriculum. Uh, and then I'll just say a few words about the, uh, the CLCA at the end. And then we're going to open it up to a Q&A. So what we'd like is for people to post any questions they have and the, and the presenters they'd like to direct it to if they have one in mind in the chat. And we'll collect those and, uh, and direct them to, uh, to the speakers as we can um, uh, at the end. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get into the uh, into the presentation. David, um, you're going to have to get out so I can get in. And there we go. OK. So I um, want to start by saying that you know, nothing here is going to make sure that your homes or property are not going to be destroyed by a fire. And what we really want to present, at least in the firescaping portion of this presentation, are just concepts and strategies that we can take to help reduce the damage caused by wildfires. Uh, one of the themes that we're going to be talking about in particular in this regard are embers. Embers are the greatest threat to homes during during wildfires. Um, I think over 80% of the, the property destruction has been caused by ember casting and not by a fire front. I mean, if a fire front comes, there's really not much anybody's gonna be able to do to stop that from, from coming through their property and over their home. But we can take steps to reduce um, and make it more difficult for fires to grow and, and cause property damage. And, damage to human life, loss of human life, and putting our first responders at risk as well while they're trying to protect our property. So um, flaming embers can, can be blown or lofted um, you know, for, for many miles. I spoke to a number of people at, at, at CAL FIRE and at the fire departments who were really themselves amazed at, at how far some of the embers were cast, like up to eight miles in some instances, maybe more commonly you know, within a mile that we see around here, but um, they can really travel quite a big distance. Um, 
So we'll talk about um, the zones that we break properties into, the five foot zone, the 30 foot zone, and the 100 foot zone. Um, and we'll talk about reducing fuel continuity um, and, and reducing uh, receptive fuel beds around the property. Um, an important, interesting note is that uh, pg and &E did a study that showed that um, with, with current emission levels um, and climate change at the rate that we're growing, um, they expect that the wildfire burn areas to grow as much as 43% over the next 30 years, which is huge because this year, I think we had over 4 million acres burn. Um, so, you know, bump that up to 6 million acres in a year and year over year, um, that, that's a lot. So uh, it's definitely um, a serious issue, a huge issue on the West Coast. Um, and as we've seen, particularly in our community, uh, that the fires came back in the middle of winter, which was just amazing in January. So um, as we said, here's some pictures from uh, Bonnie Dune that, uh, that a homeowner provided to us. These are embers that they found on their property. You can notice they're five inches wide. It's huge. These aren't campfire embers. They're not, they're not little, little sparks. They're, they're huge sources of fuel that are capable of, of creating a huge amount of, of damage and, and destruction. So we can see as, as they get as they get cast, the, the crown fires are really the worst as the fires and Marco will speak to this more, but as you know, the fire gets up higher in the tree and um, the, the casting gets further and further afield, um, which increases the issue. So what can we do? How do homes um, survive low intensity wildfires? Well, we take a number of strategies. The first is the maintenance of vegetation. Um, there's being aware of uh, combustible materials on your property, leaf litter, wood piles, lawn furniture, propane tanks, uh, lattice, um, just kind of taking a look around and, and reducing the opportunities for fire to spread. Um, and then you can also take a, an, an approach um, with the design and layout and incorporation of fire and uh, ember resistant construction materials and plants. Um, the, uh, the safety zones um, that I was talking about are uh, the five foot zones, the 30 foot zones and the, and the 100 foot zone. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm on a call. I can't, I can't talk right now. Okay. Um, sorry, life. Um, <laughs> uh, so basically uh, when we break these, these zones down, the five foot zone is, is probably obviously the most important zone. I think the, the zone that people are most familiar with, um, you know, anything within five feet of your house, overhanging branches, patio furniture, um, you know, seat cushions, privacy screens, lattices, decks, gates, um, pay special attention to, to shrubs and other flammable objects near your home. So if you have plants uh, near your house, particularly near windows, um, which can shatter from the from the radiant heat and then expose the whole home to uh, to, to embers and and fire um, and look for leaf litter, pine needles, um, and other easily flammable things. Um, basically, when you take a step out into the thirty foot zone, um, this space is is more for slowing or stopping the spread of wildfire, um, removing all the dead plants mowing grasses and weeds, having wider spaces between your living, living and living plants up to trees up to 10 feet from the ground. So um, that's, that's a big thing um, because we, we definitely want to prevent the, um, the fuel, the horizontal fuels from getting up into the, into the trees and the tree crown because that's where the greatest damage starts to happen. So as we get out into the 100 foot zone, um, we're just looking to slow the rate of spread and keep the fires out of the treetops. Um, and that's something where, uh, for a lot of properties, um, that's where the community effort comes into play because, um, you know, you're, you're usually talking to neighbors at that point and, um, and having to coordinate as a community to, uh, to create a defensible space. So when we're looking at vegetation management, we talk about horizontal and vertical fuels and trying to break fuel continuity and ladder fuels. So a defensible space breaks ladder fuel and interrupts the spread of fire to your home. We also want to reduce fire intensity by reducing fuel continuity and flame height. So even by thinning things out, pruning, separating, um, you know, any step towards reducing and eliminating the fire um, 
is, is basically a worthy um, goal. So here we have some pictures of what vertical ladder fuel looks like. You can see the picture on the left, you have the flame on the ground, uh, which has been spread as a horizontal ladder fuel, and now it's getting up into the tree. And then from those branches, um, they're going to get up further into the tree and create more ember casting. So, um, you know, if we go through and limb, and limb those trees up, um, it's going to make it more difficult for those, those ground fires to make it up into the trees. Um, so that's where fire breaks come into play. Um, if you can break up the continuity and the, and the spread of fire, um, you can see this picture on the right is a really good example of um, creating a fire break around the structures, the home and the, uh, the outbuildings and back, how the trees are all limbed up pretty far from the ground. And you can see how that fire just came right through the property and uh, left the structures you know, unaffected, relatively unaffected. Um, so I've got some pictures of what it looks like to thin and limb. Um, you can see how clearing out the understory and limbing up those trees um, is gonna make a big difference if a fire comes through there. Uh, I think, you know, going forward, um, you can see from some of these other pictures as well, it's, it's gonna be a more sparse landscape. I think, you know, in terms of what people are used to around their homes, particularly in the mountains, um, it's gonna look a little different and it's gonna take some time for people to get used to it um, because it definitely looks a little sparse and exposed, but I think that's what's gonna be required to help um, address the issue that we're having. So, you know, what can you do? Have a maintenance plan. Um, this comes in the vegetation management category. So every month, if you can, um, you want to reduce, thin, separate, remove dead material, keep plants near the home hydrated and fire resistant, which Martin will talk about. Um, there are definitely plant choices that you can make that will, you know, definitely help uh, in that end. And there's always going to be tension between you know, the water issues we have in our county and reducing water usage. Um, a lot of these plants that we put in, like rock roses and uh, other plants, they can survive with no water, but they're also going to be a, just a little more combustible um, if, if they aren't kept uh, hydrated, at least uh, to a minimal amount. So plants that we're used to sort of letting go and being on their own after a year or two um, may need to be watered a little bit uh, during the fire season. Um, Basically, uh, leaf litter is a big one, pine needles. Um, notice where leaves and debris eddy around your property. So if you see leaves, you know, tucked up in a corner underneath your deck or around the uh, garage or something in a corner, that's probably where embers are going to find their way to as well. And that's a really good uh, indicator of places that you should be paying attention to um, during your maintenance. Obviously, mow the grasses. Um, that's a big one. We spend a lot of time string trimming. Um, that's, a, that's a huge source of, of ladder fuel as it, as it dries out or really goes dormant uh, during the summer season here. Um, and then you have uh, seasonal and, you know, periodic maintenance uh, that, you can, that you can do. So, you know, you're not going to be able to every month go out into your 30 foot zone or 100 foot zone um, and do the maintenance, but, you know, maybe twice a year in the spring and in the fall, you go out uh, into the 30 foot zone and you check for flammable materials and you thin and separate and limb up branches. Um, it can be an awfully overwhelming task for people. Um, there's, there's a lot of natural growth where we live and it's something that, uh, you know, you should break off into, you know, into chunks. It doesn't all have to be done at once. Nobody's expecting that it all needs to get done on day one, but have a plan and make a little bit of progress this year, a little more progress next year, a little more progress the year after that, and just keep moving the needle and making it safe little by little because um, it's, it's a lot of work and for homeowners to do it themselves and it's expensive to have professionals come in and do it for you. So um, definitely think about um, just having some goals and, and keep chipping away at it. Um, and then, you know, every couple of years, get out into the 100 foot zone um, you know, more frequently if you can, but, um, you know, definitely pay attention to it and, and don't forget about it. Um, so on the, on the landscaping side, you know, we're starting to put a little bit more thought into particularly new landscapes and renovations, um, you know, what we can do to keep 
uh, keeping wildfires in mind to make, make the homes a little safer. So as I said, Martin's gonna talk about fire resistant plants and some choices around there. Uh, there are no fireproof plants, but there are definitely some plants that are, that are better than others. Um, in particular, maybe planting hardwoods, maple, poplar, cherry trees, apple trees, they're far less flammable than cypress, pine, fir, and other conifers, um, although they're beautiful. Um, it's definitely something to consider um, and, and to space them out properly and not have them right on top of each other. Um, choose fire retardant materials, um, stone, concrete, metal, trek. So instead of wood edging, which people use quite a lot of, um, you know, metal is a good choice. If you're building a deck uh, and you're up in the mountains and in a high risk area, trex is probably a good choice. Um, it's far less flammable than redwood. Um, and creating and creating breaks, create fire resistant stones, create stone walls, patios. Um, you know, gravel is a very good uh, material for slowing the spread of ashes. It kind of gets caught in the, the nooks and crannies uh, as it's blowing across the ground um, and can slow down or stop the spread of embers on your property. Um, I think in the past where we had large areas and we'd come in and put down 10 yards of mulch to, to cover an area with a few plants, uh, we're moving more towards putting in you know, gravel and, and different aggregates on the ground and keeping a small mulched area over the root ball of the plants. Um, and that's just a design change specifically to, to address this issue. Um, you wanna be aware of the direction of the sun and the wind. Uh, if you're on a south facing slope, um, particularly Southwest, which a lot of where we live on the West Coast and, and Santa Cruz are mostly, you know, west facing and, and south facing slopes here. Um, uh, that's, that's something to consider. Um, your, your south facing areas are, are going to be um, a lot more combustible, a lot drier. Um, and, uh, and with the wind coming from the west, you just want to be, be aware of, of what direction that's coming from and, and, and the fires coming from that area too. So, um, you can see that uh, I've got some pictures here of you know mulch right up against the edge of a wood deck. Um, you know this is an example of a of a ladder fuel. Um, you can see here um, decks and fences create fuel continuity. Um, you can see this fence um, right up to the side of the house. There's a lot of leaf and pine needle debris on the bottom, which caught fire. It's going to catch that fence on fire and go you know right into the home. Uh, likewise, to the right, the deck, you can see um, where the embers have dropped all over, not just, you know, one or two spots, but, you know, pretty substantial and, and considerable damage by those embers getting, getting caught into the, into the gaps on the, the, the wood deck. Um, you know, that's a, that's a real issue, um, something to, to keep in mind. Um, you know, for new landscapes and, and renovations, there are some designs, and these are two examples that I found online, which I thought were worth sharing. Um, you can see how this home on the left uh, survived a pretty intense wildfire. It went right around it. They had a big break. All the, the vegetation was kept lush. They had a small stone wall around the perimeter. Uh, they had good separation between their plants for the most part. Um, you can see on the right, um, within five feet of the home, it's all pretty much rock and concrete. Um, and then they have a nice, you know, fire break with this, um, with this uh, gravel area. It's almost kind of a dry creek bed, um, but uh, um, really not much vegetation near the house and up against the home. And, you know, that's definitely an ideal uh, situation if you can, if you can do that. Um, so I think people going forward, certainly with new builds are keeping this in mind um, and just be aware that it's out there and available um, if you're in that situation. And this is just a picture of, of what we don't wanna see. Uh, this is sort of the worst case scenario of, of, uh, of fuel. Um, and you can see how far the flames cast going up the slope um, and uh, the radiant heat um, is enough to do significant amount of damage to, to that home. So. Um, this is the kind of thing that you want to address over time and start working away from your home and uh, thinning this stuff out and taking care of it. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's about it on the, on the firescaping side. Um, 
I've got some resources here, uh, some links. If anyone's interested, you can always message me or contact me later. There's a, a tremendous amount available online, but these are some of the ones that I found particularly helpful and useful. Um, and I know other people will have some as well. Um, and that's, uh, that's all I have. I think, Martin, you're next. So David, you're going to want to mute me and unmute Martin. Unmuted. Okay. Hello. Am I there? It says unmute. David, are my slides up? Hello. All right. Let's go to here. Um, I think we skipped the first slide. All right. Um, We seem to be going through the slides. David, can you go back to the beginning of my slides? All right. So my message is that even when you're putting up a defense for fire in your landscaping, you do not have to sacrifice color, seasonality, and uh, lushness. Uh, a lot of the fire wise recommendations uh, seem to introduce a lot of hardscape that is walls, pavement, cleared zones. And my message is that using many, many plants, you can have a lush, colorful year round lands landscape without looking like you're always poised on the edge of an emergency. Um, so what we want to do is to use the structural elements of the landscape to prevent fire incursion. That is to remove the upper shrub layer uh, anywhere near the house so that there's no opportunity for laddering for a fire at, at ground level to climb into the canopy and from there to shoot embers onto the house, but also to use plants that have some natural resistance to fire. And those include a lot of succulent plants, plants that can um, actually have fire go over them and not ignite because of the water content of their leaves or stems. So there are lots and lots of plants to choose from. So this isn't so much about choosing a small list of species. It's looking about the plant structure, the plant roots, and the way the plants react to uh, fire. Next slide, please, David. So um, we have a lot of ongoing discussions about native versus non-native. And um, the shorthand for this is every plant is native to not just a geographical area, but to a certain kind of climate, weather pattern, soil, and conditions. And so there is no magic bullet in using only native species because uh, there are native wetland species, there are native coastal species, native mountain species. The idea that you can just put a label on a plant and it makes it better is not the case. It's all about horticulture, which plants are going to thrive in your particular conditions at your residence or your property and those that won't. Um, so, what I've done is presented these plants as, as a way of uh, looking at plants that are equally resistant to burning, to carrying fire, and um, 
then then looking at native versus non-native. And so what you wanna do is look at your aesthetics, what your design intention is with the house and not necessarily uh, be absolutely stuck on the idea that natives, that, that natives are always superior in performance. Okay, so here we have natives, agaves and yuccas are, oh, I should also mention conditions. Um, plants have certain requirements and um, Many people do not actually look at what a plant needs for um, the best performance. So I've divided these into sun versus shade. And again, this is relative. Sun usually means most of the day in full sun. Shade means most of the day in some shade. And those, those species and those groups that will thrive in those conditions. So for sun, we have agaves and yuccas. Um, it's a certain kind of look. Some people think that looks too much like a desert, but remember that agaves and yuccas do grow up and down the central coast all the way down to um, Mexico and are very, very well adapted. And they, they will ignite under intense fire circumstances, but mostly they will not. Um, Ceanothus, epilobium, fuchsia. Um, let's move on to the next slide. You all have these. Um, so again, you can, you can put together an aesthetic that you like. Um, here I've divided these into native plant groups and looking at how you can combine them. On the right hand, you have Ceanothus and Potentilla, both native shrubs, both can be low growing. I think here we're looking for structure. You don't want high shrubs that will carry fire into the canopy or into the eave of the house. And on the left side, we're looking at very low growing or very fire resistant plants. So these are all full sun native plants. And again, native is a very, very subjective term. It's, it's not whether it belongs in California or Nevada or Mexico. It means where it evolved and what conditions are appropriate for its growth. Um, my other message is that in order to do a fire wise or a fire resistant landscape, you don't have to strip down to something that's plain or only one species or unattractive. You should be able to have color, flowers, texture and design intention year round without necessarily sacrificing everything to the idea of stuff that won't just burn. So next slide, David, oh, there you are. Um, here we are looking at shade, um, the acerum, the wild ginger. This is a very, very low ground cover, does wonderfully in shade, especially under um, a tall canopy. Uh, the ferns, of course, the ferns absolutely must be in shade. And in many cases, they, they do require extra moisture. Uh, one of the, the criteria for a sustainable landscape for me is something that leads little to no supplemental irrigation after it is established. And that should be your hallmark. If you have to keep your plants watered all year round, then you're setting yourself up for great losses in the cases where you can't water or whether, uh, or if you have an extremely long, hot, dry season. Oregon grape is a wonderful uh, plant. There are several varieties and uh, several species. Uh, remember there are cultivated varieties which have been selected from um, um, native plants, but they perform better in one way or another. The Oregon grape has wonderful yellow blooms in the spring, followed by very bright blueberries, which are also edible. And that's why the early um, Anglo settlers called them Oregon grape. Of the California iris, Iris de Glaciana, is spectacular when it's in bloom, and it also makes a great and practically fireproof um, ground cover the rest of the year. Next slide, David. Um, here we're looking at exotic or introduced species. These are species that evolved elsewhere. Remember here on the central coast, we're in a Mediterranean climate that is hot, dry summers, no rain at all, and cool, moist winters. And so there are other parts of the world, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere, Australia and South Africa that have plants that are excellent here um, and that will go through fires without any damage at all um, for uh, full sun areas, we have 
aloes and aeoniums, aloes from South Africa, aeoniums from the Mediterranean and the uh, Canary and Azore Islands, grevillea from Australia, uh, daylilies, uh, which have been hybridized, and the Steldoro is one that blooms constantly throughout the year. And then finally, salvia, which is a wonderful genus, hundreds of species, and some are native, some are not, but they all make a very low growing, very colorful, long blooming ground cover. And these things, if a fire did come, um, they might be scorched, but they really would not be um, wiped out. And the main point here is that these plants will not carry a fire. So you can have color around your house. You don't need a blank slate. You don't need concrete and gravel exclusively to protect your house. If you have low growing, either juicy leafed plants or plants that have very low fuel value, you will not have to worry about a fire being carried across them. Next slide, David. Oops. Um, here we have some introduced plants for shade. Uh, the winter creepers, this is Euonymus. Um, all of you will have access to these slides and so you can look them up online. Lots of, um, lots of information on them. And all of these are available here in the Central Coast nurseries. Grevilleas, there are ground cover grevilleas. Um, most people think of grevilleas from Australia. They bloom many, many months of the year. Some of them are tall shrubs, which I would not use. Um, they're fire adapted, that is if they do burn, they will come back from the root. But here I'm highlighting Grevillea medusa, coastal gem, and other species and varieties of ground cover um, Grevilleas, which are um, pretty much ironclad fireproof. Um, salvias, we have native salvias here in California in the Central Coast. And um, then we have lots of introduced species. These also bloom most of the year and are incredibly useful in a, a firewise landscape. And then just for um, foliage texture, the acacia cousinet, this is a cultivar of an Australian um, acacia. It is low and mounding. It looks lush and green, but amazingly it needs zero irrigation. And um, its stems are very, very thin. So even though it looks like it might be fuel, this one really has no fuel value in a fire. So what we're looking for is a combination of plants that give you color, that give you texture, that give you all the values you want for a landscape, but that either do not carry fire or that are totally resilient to fire. That is, for instance, the grevilleas, the acacias, if they are burned, many of them will come back from the roots. And so you don't have to worry about um, losing your plants even in uh, an intense fire. Next slide, please. Oops. And here is one solution to a completely fireproof landscape. Uh, this is mostly succulents. Succulents are juicy, that we have succulents. Um, remember, succulent is, is a lifestyle. It's not a particular kind of plant. Succulents are plants that have juicy or water retaining stems or uh, leaves or other parts, and they are extremely fire resistant. Um, this one has a combination of American and Mexican natives, South Africans and Australian plants, all combined for a, a garden that puts year round color. Um, this one, this is my back garden, I, I should say. Um, one of the other things that makes this fire resistant is that I use gravel as a mulch instead of organic mulch. Organic mulch can be really, really uh, problematic. I've seen fires start in urban areas where people have tossed a cigarette into a shrub or flower bed that is piled high with bark mulch. Um, bark mulch decomposes, it blows away, and it also is as, just as good for weeds as it is for the plants you wish to cultivate. So in our situation, I think that gravel mulch, either gravel or stone, is the best way to maintain a fireproof ground level that, that, that will also promote healthy plant growth. So remember, there is no magic list of plants. You still have to look at your individual site conditions, slope, aspect, rainfall, and temperature. But within those categories, there are plants you can choose that will be beautiful, give you the aesthetic effect that you want, and that will not carry or promote fire. And some of that is simply structure. 
If you have trees, if you have tall trees, we've talked a lot about pruning them up. Um, remember, if you're on a slope and you have heavy forest, you might have a canopy fire coming towards you. But if you can keep the ground level fuel from reaching the canopy, you have a much better chance of avoiding the kind of crown fire that will lead to destruction of, of buildings and other structures um, in your landscape. And I think that's it for me. Just remember, it's not a matter of just a few plants that are best suited to your landscape. It is also choosing plants from all those available that are effective for your landscape. And I'm happy to take questions later and I'll look at the, the chats now as we continue. Thanks very much. Oops. Mark, you should be able to unmute. Got muted again. Okay, how about there? Yep, we can hear All right. you. Uh, Marco Mac from Aptos of Selva Fire, which has just become central fire of Santa Cruz County. And um, I put some information in the chat that um, includes a link to um, documents and information plus copies of my slides. And you're welcome to get access to those. And I'm gonna be addressing um, understanding wildfire behavior as well as working into um, um, home hardening. And the strategy that we're trying to take in Santa Cruz County is how can we become a fire adapted community and bring information to residents to understand what would a fire look like as it comes to your property. And our intention is that we want fire intensity to reduce as it gets close to your house and closer and closer through the different zones that we talk about to a point five feet from the house where you would have nothing that would be um, uh, flammable in that area, then the codes are actually changing right now where in the next couple of years, we're gonna be requiring an ember resistant zone within five feet. Right now, we can't require you to do a non-combustible area, but, um, but it is coming. And the idea that we're looking for is homes that have survived wildfire. When you look at those pictures, like this one house survived, the commonality of that would be those homes typically have a five foot area around their home that's not combustible. So I've got a list of questions here that I'm gonna come back to after I do this one portion and we'll make sure we answer all those. But the key to this would be recognizing the different ways fire attacks your house and, and reducing fire intensity. Fire intensity is, um, I'm trying to get my, there we go. Fire intensity is measured by flame length. So if you look at this first picture that I have here, direct flame contact, flame could burn all the way to your home. In that picture, we've got fire burning in a forest floor and it's a surface fire and it's starting to climb up into the trees. And you see the flame length in one area is probably 10, 12 feet and fuels burn about one and a half times the height of the fuel. In the lower picture there with radiation, we have trees um, that are starting to catch on fire. Um, the way we get um, um, very, very intense fire would be a surface fire transitions from ladder fuels and starts to burn up into the trees. And in this case, you'll see trees that are probably 60, 70 foot tall, and then 100, 125 foot flames coming off that. Tremendous amount of, of radiant heat is, is generated from that type of a fire. So other ways that your home can be at risk from wildfire would be embers. And there's two ways that embers might attack your house. And the typical way would be on the top here where you've got a really well-involved fire, a lot of high intensity. And then embers are thrown up into the thermal column 
and the wind takes it and they travel downwind and they end up dropping around your house, on your house. And if there's an ember um, a, a fuel bed that is receptive to embers, it can ignite. Um, the other way that we have embers attack your house would be particularly like on a slope where you have a thermal column and wind and those embers are following in line with the slope and um, um, attacking your house by a continuous flow of um, hot gases and embers flying at your house. So the requirements from CAL FIRE, and if you're in the SRA, um, you've got um, requirements to create defensible space. Defensible space started in forest areas where there were homes in the middle of the forest. And to um, save the forest, they required a defensible space that if your home caught fire, that you wouldn't catch the forest on fire. CAL FIRE took that idea and extended it even further that um, if a wildfire is approaching your home, their interest is that there's a safe place for firefighters to work near your home. Years ago, we had um, a terminology that we used quite readily and it was called your home's a winner or a loser. We would decide if we were gonna do structure protection around homes in a community and we would pass on the homes that are losers. And then homes that have something to work with, they've done some fuel modifications, they have access. There's a safe place for firefighters to work around the home a place that we can park our fire engine and not be subject to intense heat. So um, homes that are mid slope, top of slope, they're very, very difficult to um, reduce the vegetation. And chances are in many cases, these homes are actually flammable themselves, very difficult to protect a home like that. So we're looking at adding a new concept of ember resistant zone for zero to five feet. Um, I like the idea of thinking of that as being non-combustible. And then the five foot to 30 foot, um, I like the terminology, clean, lean, and green. Um, there would be very few things in that area, 30 feet from your home, that can ignite from embers. And if a fire is traveling along the surface as it gets to your home, in that five foot to 30 foot, that decides if your home is going to be able to save itself. And the flame length would get less and less. And as you saw in the previous um, presentation, that a lot of green, well-maintained vegetation is what... Um, you need to have. If you've got woody things, if you've got um, shrubberies, green things, the stuff that's not maintained and there's a lot of litter, that's a risk to you. So the area 30 foot to 100 foot out from the home would be very, very important if you were mid slope, top of slope, and you end up with uh, um, fire intensity being increased because there is a slope. So <clears throat> Taking this a bit further, the picture on the top that we've got a home and we have vegetation around it. So if you went from the right of the screen towards the home, a surface fire can easily get into the trees. The picture down below that, if you go from right um, and head towards that home, you would have a surface fire that increases intensity as these bushes burn and the bushes are actually separated. So the intensity of one bush doesn't easily lead to another. And it'd be very difficult to get um, a tree to burn in this scenario. So what we call is that thinning, the thin out the um, surface fuels and then break the fuel continuity so that, you, so that way you're separating areas that are burning and then you're removing ladder fuels. This is all the, the basic, basic strategy. So embers are a risk. So on the left picture there, we have a tree that's torching. Surface fire was able to preheat the tree above and the flames went and burned its way up into the tree. When vegetation burns, it actually heats it up, gases come off the vegetation, and it's the gases that burn. So if you add some wind, that process is, um, is increased. It's almost like it's shaking loose some of the vapors and um, it increases intensity. So this picture shows a, a tree torching. It creates a thermal column. It raises bits and pieces of burning embers that are lifted and then the wind blows those further downwind. And there's a point where those embers hitting the ground are still flammable and there's an opportunity for them to ignite. And then further downwind, you end up with the embers have burnt themselves out. The picture on the right is the Traving Fire taken from um, Santa Cruz. And you can see a huge, huge thermal column coming up from that. That fire has a lot of intensity and it is throwing embers out in front of um, where the fire is at. And those embers are finding a receptive fuel bed and the fire is just extending and moving along. 
When a fire gets to that size, very, very difficult to contain it and, and confine it. So January 19th, we had a fire, the Freedom Fire in, um, in Aptos, La Selva, kind of in the Day Valley area. And at that fire, it was very, very unique. It was a fire that started because of wind, a tree blew down and the tree hit some power lines. The fire ended up burning about 37 acres. But what was very unique about that is the timeline. Um, at about one o'clock in the morning, the temperature changed, the um, humidity changed, and we ended up with a weather front coming through that caused um, at the ocean along the coast, 17% humidity at one o'clock in the morning. At uh, 7, 7.30 in the morning, we had 30 mile an hour winds. And that wind ended up causing this tree to damage, be damaged and fall. A fire burned for several hours. It was in an area that wasn't easily detected. There was smoke coming from an area. Um, we did not have a report of exactly where that fire was. We we're in the area of Freedom, which is very, very rugged between Freedom and White Road. And the fire was burning through that area. Um, and what ended up happening at about 10 o'clock, it burned up a slope into a grove of redwoods, and we burned 140 redwoods that were juvenile, like 8-inch to 16-inch trees that were 60, 70 foot tall. And those trees burned in a, um, a patch of like 50 foot by 75 foot area, and it was like a freight train coming through. There was 100, 120 foot flames coming off this, the, these trees in January and it sent embers out and embers actually traveled a quarter mile and started a spot fire. And it started a spot fire on a uh, north facing slope, which is very, very green. It's, it burned for several more acres on this other slope. So we had this extreme fire behavior. This could have been prevented if that redwood grove had been limbed up even six foot. So a very low intensity surface fire was able to race up into the trees. It was extremely, extremely, um, um, scary. So this is Klaus. He's my friend from Germany, and he's going to give us an example of what not to do. So I would expect that um, in this picture, you can see he's standing there. He just lit these reeds on fire. So it's an area that's probably like three foot by six foot area, and he must do this every year. But you can kind of see that his pants are um, fluttering. And when I watch that, we'll watch, when you watch this video, you're going to see that this is a a very high intensity fire, extreme fire behavior because of wind. And the size of the fire right now, it's like he just kneeled down, he lit the reeds on fire and it's going and it's kind of like a good example of a receptive fuel bed for an ember that um, is, um, is in there. So we're gonna watch Klaus and the, the end of this story is Within 60 seconds, you have high intensity flames. You've got like 12 foot torching flames. So Klaus is um, um, watching this. It's starting to take off. You can kind of see the wind. Look how lush and green the background is. This is an area that gets a lot of moisture, but the wind adds intensity. It's extreme. You see the flames moving to the left. The thermal column isn't going up. The reeds aren't burning. The thermal column's going to the left. It's preheating the material next to it, and it's catching fire. So it, next to this is some green shrubbery. And it's an area of vegetation that's not well maintained. If you open that up, you'd see a lot of dead um, uh, duff and other material in there. You can kind of see it's not burning the green. It's, it's got white coming off of it. That's the moisture from the green. And the inside of the bushes is starting to burn. Yeah, you might want to get a hose. <laughs> so look at this. Within 60 seconds, we have torching. And it was a very, very little ember that was um, in an area that was a receptive fuel bed and it was and it moved closer and closer to the homes. If you look at hedges, and generally they're old, they've been around for a while, they have a lot of dead material in it, that's very, very dangerous to have close to your home. So I'm going to go back to the beginning here and through these questions. Why do some homes survive a wildfire? 
it would be that the residents have reduced the amount of fuels, particularly as you get closer to the home. So then that way the fire intensity is less and less. If you have a wood fence that's attached to your home, it could theoretically catch fire somewhere and then it leads to the home and then it burns all the way to the home. Um, so the factors that increase fire intensity, wind is the big one. When we have red flag, particularly September, October, November, you need to be prepared for high intensity fire. And you'd wanna make sure police around your home that there is nothing within five, of the, five feet of the home that can burn. Plastic, trash cans, things like that, move them away from the house or inside the house. Um, I like what um, some of the folks had talked about in Marin County, where if you get your evacuation order and you're in a high risk area and you have gates with um, wood fence attached out, if you left that gate open, there's an opportunity of providing a separation between the house and a wooden fence. So um, is your home ignitable? Is it combustible? Is your home at risk? You have to do much more of vegetation clearance around your home and you really need to work on that, work on that five foot combustible, non-combustible area around your home. And then our concern for a home being defensible, is it safe place for firefighters to work? Um, can the firefighters park? We call it a temporary refuge area, a place I can park my fire engine when I'm at your home to do defensible space and I can get access to the water supply. And we're trying to create this mechanism where it's your yard, your house, and we're trying to help you understand what a wildfire would look like coming to your house. So that, that way, the things you do, particularly within 30 feet of your house, there's an opportunity that you're gonna protect your home. So that way you only need to um, prevent your home at being at risk from flying embers. And embers are so small that there's an opportunity to not get an ignition within that one minute or so that it continues to burn as it strikes your house or around your house. That's, that would be the time that we're looking at that you could um, save your home. So I'm gonna to switch to this other video. All right, so home hardening. Home hardening is the idea of stuff that you could do on your home so that way it's at less risk. And um, the big greatest concern is from flying embers. And this is an example that the insurance industry put together. They did a test sample of a home with ignitable materials close to the home, embers fly at the home and they ignite on the right. You still have a wooden structure in front of the stoop, but the structure itself and the siding is, um, is fire retardant. And the biggest component is there's nothing else that's really ignitable around the home. On the left, um, they put mulch on the ground. The, um, I've been to uh, vegetation fires where all the mulch is burning. And it's just um, amazing how, um, particularly in red flag where you have low humidity and wind, it's just easily, easily ignited and it just continues to burn and it draws fire all the way to your home. So I have another video here, and this is a sample of uh, details from one of these tests where they put generators and throw embers at your house. And, um, there's other videos that are available of this online and that timing of material to start to catch on fire was it within a minute or so. And the embers flying around, um, they're, they're gonna find anything that's a receptive fuel bed and start igniting that. And you don't want that close to your home. So the gutters are a big risk if you have embers. If you're under redwood trees and you always have that um, duff coming down, we're actually getting to a point where maybe you consider not even having um, um, gutters and that you manage your um, wildfire risk by or your water risk on the ground. Okay, so what I've done for you is provided some very, very basic information on hardening. Um, I've provided some handouts and some resources that we can refer you to and you're welcome to contact me by email and I can send some more information to you. But um, this is just some basic information about um, defensible space, reducing fire intensity close to your home and um, bringing that awareness to you. Um, there's great concern with insurance companies and we're trying to help residents understand what their wildfire risk. And we're seeing two things that 
insurance companies are looking for. And one of them is um, we've had residents telling us that Mercury Insurance is asking if you're in a uh, FireWise neighborhood, and we'll provide more information for you um, in this presentation for that. And the other would be, I'm expecting that an insurance company is going to ask you for, show me a video of five foot from your house. You've got the bougainvillea by your house. You've got some um, older vegetation that's become really woody. Um, rosemary that's within five feet of your house where you end up with that woody um, um, duff material that's built into it. We need to change our idea of what vegetation looks like close to our homes and um, move hedges away. Move those things that create that woody material and um, ember um, uh, receptive fuel beds. Okay, sir, that is the, the end of my part of all of this. And um, I'm going to send you back to the rest of the group. All right, thanks, Marco. I'm next, and let's see, where are my slides? Perfect. All right, well, I'm Liz Croft. I'm a local realtor here in Santa Cruz County. Uh, I've been in real estate for about eight years now, and in a former life, I was in risk management with an insurance company. I was kind of like Ben Stiller from Along Came Polly, if, uh, <laughs> if anybody saw that one. Um, and was pretty heavily involved in helping our claims departments um, manage uh, wildfire risk and working with our insureds on some of those inspections that Marco had just uh, kind of discussed. So one of the problems we faced with those was just who was going to do those inspections for the insurance companies. And um, I'll touch on it a little bit later, but I think that's one of the opportunities with the real estate community and um, kind of helping, you know, the fire council and, and other folks um, be the boots on the ground with these homeowners and, um, and helping keep an eye on and um, manage the inspections. Um, so the CZU fire that we just had was the largest that the Santa Cruz County has experienced. Um, you know, I think a lot of residents sort of thought that, you know, it'll never happen in my backyard and um, kind of got a little lackadaisical about it. So uh, in the fire, 103 structures were destroyed. Uh, 997 of them were residences. Um, and we've already kind of been facing a housing shortage for the last number of years, um, not keeping up with building and demand just keeps skyrocketing. So, um, you know, we got lucky. I think the winds could have been a lot worse. Um, there could have been a bigger loss but uh, you know, now it's on everybody's radar um, and I think people are starting to pay attention um, as a result. Um, so firescaping and insurability. Uh, as I mentioned before, some insurance companies are doing basic requirements on inspections. Um, they'll con contact with either their own employees or a, a third party to check on sort of the basic things like is there a wood shake roof um, have the trees been limbed and things like that. Um, so to get a homeowner's policy, a lot of these insurance companies now are requiring a basic level of clearance, but it's still not quite enough. Um, and a lot of the reason why folks aren't um, doing more is the insurance companies aren't requiring more. <laughs> There's only a, a basic level. There's no incentive to, uh, to go above and beyond because they're not receiving a discount um, on their insurance premiums as a result of that. Um, so, you know, un until the insurance companies get a little bit more involved, um, you know, that, I don't know that that is going to really incentivize homeowners, unfortunately. Um, there is a, a, something called the Fireline Score with the Insurance Services Office, and they developed that based on fuel, slope, and access. And so a lot of insurance companies are using that score to uh, kind of quantify the amount of the premium for these homes. Um, and then also deciding if they plan on actually issuing the policy or uh, renewing policies. Um, so there's a lot that we can do with those fire line scores to help lower it um, and hopefully you know, improve the insurability of properties. Um, and insurability um, is definitely a factor when it comes to purchasing 
a home or maintaining your uh, your mortgage. Um, you know, uh, banks want to make sure that a home is insurable <laughs> before they start loaning money. Um, certainly, lots of money these days, and um, so uh, increased rates are increasing the monthly payments for homeowners. And that is in the form of the monthly PITI payments. That's the property uh, interest taxes and insurance. And you know, this becomes an issue where as those monthly payments increase, um, homeowners are faced with you know, a higher cost of living um, and as a result need a higher qualifying income. Um, so you know, as our prices continue to rise, it's not just the actual sales price of homes, it's, you know, the bigger picture of those monthly payments um, and affordability keeps shrinking for a lot of, a lot of home buyers these days. Um, and, um, you know, that's <laughs> just kind of the name of the game right now. Um, and it's unfortunate in these mountain communities, uh, they are historically some of the more affordable areas in our community. Um, but as the, the cost of insurance goes up, that is changing for, for families. And so the future of firescaping and the real estate industry, uh, you know, how can realtors and the real estate community get involved and help um, you know, homeowners protect themselves and implement some of these changes? Um, you know, the community often turns to realtors for help with these sorts of things. We're the boots on the ground for, uh, for a lot of things. Um, we interact with homeowners and communities and neighborhoods. Um, as I'm sure all of you know, 15 or 20 realtors out there, um, and we all know a ton of homeowners. Uh, a perfect example was in 2018, um, the city and county of Santa Cruz uh, implemented the sewer lateral ordinance. And that was uh, with the, um, Oh, I'm forgetting their name right now. Um, but it was to clean up the water quality in the San Lorenzo River and the Monterey Bay and um, a point of sale ordinance inspecting the sewer lateral lines from the home to the, the city connection. Um, and at the transfer, making sure that those um, have been repaired or replaced um, just to help with the groundwater. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, fuss about that and oh my gosh, it's going to be so expensive and it's going to cost our homeowners so much money and the inspections are going to take forever. But two years into it, you know, the community and, uh, and the industry has really jumped on board and understands the importance and how to navigate it. So, uh, you know, I see with the, the fire escaping, um, I could definitely foresee, and I think it, it's already in the works, uh, point of sale, changes to what is required for hardening homes um, and requiring that disclosure be addressed um, by the buyer and the seller. So um, it might be sort of like the um, water retrofit uh, certification that's required. And that is, you know, low flow toilets and shower heads. Um, now the responsibility can be transferred from a seller to a buyer. Um, you know, obviously it, it, it kind of is situational. Every home is different. Every, you know, buyer and seller's needs are different. Um, but uh, there's already a few disclosures that are rolling out from the California Association of Realtors. Um, one of those is the um, home hardening retrofit, the HHDA, if there's any <laughs> industry folks on here with me. Uh, and that is a disclosure that sellers are required to provide for homes built before 2010. Um, they weren't built to the same standards uh, as homes that are newer. And that is a checklist of things like the roof, um, siding materials, and, and things like that. So um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for the real estate industry to help with this and to help educate homeowners and um, you know, implement some of these checklists at the, the time of sale, um, just to add another layer of um, you know, help with inspections and, and education and making sure the work is done. So um, we'll see what happens with that in the future. And if there's any questions, um, here's where you guys can find me. And with that, I will pass it off to the next presenter. Okay. 
Good morning, everybody. I guess I'm the next presenter, and there you go. <laughs> um, I'm representative. I'm a board member on the Fire Safe Council of Santa Cruz County. Um, the, the council was set up a little over three years ago now. Um, the Santa Cruz uh, County Board of Supervisors recognizing that uh, there was a um, not a countywide um, organization that uh, actually worked on uh, educating the public about um, uh, uh, forest fires while in the communities and in the environment. Um, so they uh, set out to uh, set up the council. Uh, they sponsored uh, the uh, the uh, incorporation as a nonprofit uh, organization. And uh, our mission is to educate, and mobilize the people of Santa Cruz County, protect the community, homes, and environment. Um, one of the main reasons that uh, the county finally recognized that there should be some organization looking after things like this in the county is that, as you can see by the, uh, the statistics below, about three quarters of the county is in what is called the, the WUI or the Wildland Urban Interface. Um, and so with the, the main purpose behind the council is to, to make sure that um, we stay on top of what is the latest uh, prevention and, and defensible space uh, opportunities. Um, so what, a couple of things that we do uh, in particular is to um, educate the public. So we've had, in the last couple of years, we have had grants that helped us sponsor uh, meetings like this. Uh, we did a lot of them in person uh, the first couple of years um, throughout the county and did a home hardening uh, presentation. Um, and in this past fall, we did a, actually with Cabrillo College, um, we did an educational course uh, that was uh, done over uh, two, um, two Saturdays like this that was much more detailed into how to harden your home, uh, the work that could be done and things like that. Um, so uh, next page, uh, please. Um, what we tried to do with the council was bring together as many stakeholders within the county that have interest in uh, fire prevention. And as you can see, we've, we've uh, been able to get uh, quite a bit of participation. Um, we're hoping that in the long run, we'll be able to use the, uh, all of these uh, organizations to help us leverage uh, opportunities with grants through uh, primarily through the state. Um, that will help us do fuel reduction projects within the, the county. So some of the things that you may have seen done is along um, Graham Hill Road, uh, there's been a fire break or a fuel break uh, done there. We have a project that um, is being done through Cal Fire in Felton right now. Um, and in the long run, we want to be able to do this on a regular basis. So. Um, Using these stakeholders, uh, we are able to uh, to go after grants that will actually help the county. Um, uh, next page uh, is uh, so. Right now, uh, as you can see, there's some things that you can find as use us as a resource. Our website has some, in particularly, great. Uh, pieces of information to prepared and not scared is a great brochure to teach you about um, how to prepare your home and how to prepare for an emergency evacuation. Uh, certainly uh, would have been helpful for the CZU people. Um, the other one that I wanna point out is the in-depth home hardening video. This is the presentation that we've done in the last couple of years. And it is a uh, about, oh, I think it's 45 minutes long, maybe a little bit longer, um, that really goes into the depth of, of how to harden each, each of your homes. And in particular, as was just mentioned, homes that are built before 2010 
the codes uh, did not really address um, some of the, the newer uh, thoughts on how to protect your home. So a uh, real good, um, good video to see. Um, and if there's any major questions, we have a vice president that can field some questions for you. And uh, hope to see you soon. I think that's it. All right. Can everybody see my screen? All right. My name is Lynn Sestak, and um, I'm a volunteer with the uh, Fire Safe um, Santa Cruz that Ed just told you about, and also a volunteer with the Santa Clara uh, Fire Safe Council as a FireWise um, coach. And so, what I'd like to do is just briefly tell you about what FireWise USA is. Um, and if you'd like some more information about it, you can contact me afterwards. I'll leave my email address in the chat. Um, so up until now, you've been hearing a lot about home hardening, um, individual work that you can do around your own home. And so how does that relate to FireWise? So FireWise um, is a method for connecting community members together. Because if you're, even if you do the best home hardening job in the world around your house, if your neighbor's house catches fire, your house is likely to catch fire too. So um, Firewise USA is a framework that helps neighbors work together to make their homes more or their community more fire safe. And as Liz mentioned um, and others have mentioned, it's also something that insurance companies are starting to pay attention to. And you're also making your um, community safer for firefighters to come in to try to defend your home. So Firewise USA, is a national program. And actually, um, many of you attendees on this call are uh, FireWise leaders. So it's really great to see um, people from the community here. So uh, FireWise USA is a national program. There's about um, 1,600 sites nationally. Here in Santa Cruz County, we have 10 recognized sites already. And we have about 10 that are in progress um, uh, uh, seeking to achieve that recognition. It's a framework that helps um, neighbors collaborate with their community to reduce risk. There's six basic steps for a community to follow and then you uh, would apply and receive this recognition. Um, and um, in terms of like, why would you want to do this? I had already mentioned um, the, in, the possible um, insurance benefits. Um, it helps your fire professionals want to actually feel safer coming in to defend your community. And you also uh, promote a lot of camaraderie within your community. Um, at the base of this slide, I have a list of some of the locally um, recognized FireWise communities, just as reference. So the six steps for FireWise is you create a um, steering committee, and that if you're an HOA, that might be part of your existing board. You're going to collaborate on a wildfire risk assessment with your local fire professional or CAL FIRE. You're going to host one educational event. You're going to develop a multi-year action plan. You're going to meet a minimum wildfire risk reduction investment, which for our area is ridiculously low. It's one hour per household or $26 per household per year. So if you just get out a weed whack once, you've met that. Um, and then you create and submit your application to the FireWise portal. So uh, you know, what are some of the benefits? It's getting people, getting neighbors together um, to help each other. It helps your whole community be more fire um, protected. You can do work parties, you can celebrate together, you could have education events such as there's wildfire evacuation workshops that are available through Zoom, which are very beneficial, especially for, um, for our area. Um, you can collaborate with neighbors for brush and tree clearing parties. In, in fact, my neighborhood is out doing a, a chipping and clearing party right now. So after I'm done with this, I got to go out and help them. Um, and then um, as a community, you could consider uh, emergency communication methods such as um, WhatsApp or whatever to quickly um, notify each other of an emergency situation. Um, another thing is getting children involved, you know, um, getting everybody in the neighborhood aware of what to do proactively about if there is a wildfire, how do we evacuate, how can we protect against it. So in summary, your local fire safe councils are here to help educate and support your efforts um, in wanting to be a firewise community. 
um, he, he, I've left the uh, web address for the Fire Safe um, Santa Cruz, which Ed also gave you, and then my um, uh, contact information, which I'll also put in chat. And in the slides, you'll see some other um, uh, resources that you can use. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna turn this over to, I think John is next. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Well, look at that, it came up. So hi everybody, uh, it's been great uh, visiting with you. Um, I'm close to the last presenter, uh, so I'll try to make it fast. I'm just here to announce and give some details about um, a course we're giving at Monterey Peninsula College uh, coming up in April, two Saturdays uh, in a row, 17th and 24th. We'll have a approximately two hour morning and two hour afternoon with a nice long break. Um, it may be that we've uh, been reminded today that uh, more than an hour, hour and a half of Zoom is uh, pretty hard to sit through. So we'll do our best to make it uh, interesting and useful um, as today's um, presentations have been. Just uh, congratulations, Phil, for putting this together, pulling these people together, very impressive. Um, this is just, uh, don't read the slide. This is just my cue to give you a little bit more of a description of the course. Um, we expect to draw horticulture students who are there to earn credit. And then we expect to draw homeowners and perhaps uh, HOA uh, you know, managers and board members um, into the same course. Um, and, and the you know, we will review uh, a lot of the points made today, hardening homes, um, you know, defensible space, but we're gonna try to focus on uh, how to uh, practice horticulture in fire country. Um, so uh, plant selection, irrigation, uh, rainwater collection, uh, ways to, um, as Martin earlier, uh, uh, so, beautifully expressed it, um, not give up on beauty, color, uh, texture, and enjoyment of our gardens and landscapes, while at the same time, uh, you know, maintaining fire resilience. Um, we're pretty proud to, to be able to feature Douglas Kent. Uh, some of you may know his book, Firescaping. It's fairly recently come out in a second edition. Um, very qualified uh, guy, landscape architect, uh, teacher at Cal Poly Pomona, and uh, spent a lot of time in um, uh, fire zones, post-fire analyzing uh, what worked, what didn't work. Uh, includes in this book a lot of the same uh, principles that we've heard about today. Um, and uh, maybe he'll be able to uh, expand on that a little bit. Um, Shaw Rice and I mean, Cheryl Miller and Carol Rice are also authors, a little bit more extensive um, uh, reference book, a uh, little bit more for, um, you know, public agency uh, leaders, um, managing fire in the urban wildland interface. They have uh, experience consulting for actual projects in our Monterey County, uh, for which uh, we hope to have good before and after uh, photos that uh, we think will inspire. And, um, and Cheryl, I believe, is the executive director of the Diablo uh, Fire Safe Council as well. She's a landscape architect with lots of experience, and Carol has a lot of experience in consulting uh, for a very long time. Uh, Seth Parker is a local contractor, uh, arborist. He's got every kind of certification you can imagine, uh, and owner and operator of this uh, contracting company called Pacific Land water and home. Um, you can see some of his vegetation management equipment right there in the, in the background. Um, got a lot of practical experience hardening homes, uh, vegetation control in, in some of the more remote Monterey County um, uh, you know, zones, uh, homes for better or worse being placed right in the path of danger. Um, you know, that's a different question whether those some of those homes should have ever been built, but in the meantime, we've got them um, and some of them are very high end and they can afford uh, to try to protect and harden their homes 
and manage the landscape. So Seth will have good comments uh, to share on you know how it works on the ground, both the vegetation management and and uh, home hardening and even fire suppression systems uh, that are being marketed for for homes and environments like this. A few other uh, speakers, um, Peter Quintanilla, you may know, he's a consulting arborist and instructor at MPC and Cabrillo. Um, he'll talk about uh, some of the tree management, maybe you know, good approaches to, to the limbing. Jonathan Pangburn is a forester with the local CAL FIRE unit. Um, Rebecca Schrunenberger is a uh, contractor uh, focusing mainly on California natives and uh, has great comments to share on maintenance. Uh, that was mentioned earlier today, but you know, it may be less important which plants we select and more important how they are maintained, when they are cut back, when they are thinned, um, et cetera. So uh, she'll be uh, a good resource on that, a good reminder. And of course, Phil has agreed to join us. Um, and so um, that'll be great. Uh, you know, another voice of experience from on the ground. And Dan Finklia is a local uh, landscape contractor and general contractor who has started to really move into rainwater collection cisterns uh, and systems like that, which uh, we uh, hope to feature and inspire uh, homeowners, you know, to create alternative water sources that the firefighters can use when they uh, show up at the uh, winner, not the loser uh, site. Um, hopefully that'll help make a, a property a winner. Um, and to some extent, uh, help supplement their own irrigation needs without, um, you know, having a big impact on, on water supply and water conservation. Uh, you, you know, that, that's the trade-off. Uh, one year water conservation is highest priority next year fire safe landscape principles uh, call for additional irrigation in many cases. Uh, so uh, maybe Dan will help us understand how we can at least try to get a little bit of both. Um, to register is extremely difficult and challenging. Um, I will personally offer congratulations to anybody who manages to navigate the system. Um, luckily I'm available for anyone who um, has trouble it all starts at the MPC um, homepage. Uh, there's an admissions tab, then you have to actually apply to MPC as a student if you're not already. Um, then you'll receive an email with a student number and you, you go from there following the prompts. Um, again, the name of the course is Horticulture 210. Uh, current topics, um, and this year we picked this uh, topic that we think is extremely current and extremely important and we hope will be valuable to to the attendees of, of this uh, eight hour two weekend course. Um, if you're not an MPC student, I believe the fees will end up being around $53. Uh, $53. Um, if you're already a student like many of our horticulture students are, uh, some of those fees will have already been paid. So with that, um, I'm through with my pitch. Thank you very much. Phil, you're next. I uh, can't. Uh, okay, there we go. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, I was just going to say a few quick words about the uh, California Landscape Contractors Association. Um, you know, we're just out there trying to uh, bring the industry together for important issues like this and water conservation and other things that are relevant to our community. And, um, you know, we're a, a group of local contractors that are, you know, uh, committed to um, improving our own education understanding of important issues around the landscaping community and, uh, and, and taking them out into our community. And we have a lot of partners uh, we had some slides, but somehow the file got corrupted, so we can't share them. But we have, uh, you know, a number of partners in the community that make that happen. And um, you know, thank thanks everyone for for joining today, um, uh, making our community a better place for everyone. Um, uh, if if this um, we were going to do some Q and A, but I'm noticing uh, in the chat session that's going on uh, a, a lot of um, uh, back and forth has already occurred. So. 
David, I don't know if you just want to unmute everyone or allow people if there are any questions, or I should say maybe if anybody has a pressing question that has not been answered or addressed in the chat room, maybe you could post something now um, and we can we can get to it. And um, and if, if not, then uh, we'll let everybody get on with their weekend. Yeah, I, I can unmute everybody, Phil, if we want to do a quick session. Sure. Yeah, let's do that. All right. Hey, Liz. Okay, there we go. I uh, I was trying to keep track of questions that weren't answered in the chat for all of us. So um, in no particular order and uh, aimed at no particular presenter. Um, one of them was that um, the person that appreciates the integrated approach um, and supporting our wildfire challenges, but how do we uh, as individuals and homeowners stay on top of the latest thinking issues resources? Is there kind of one go-to spot where um, you know all of this information is, is staying current? Well, Liz, I, I think that um, one of the methods is to stay in touch with the with the fire council of santa cruz county i think their repository of knowledge for the community um, that's probably the most central place in our community where people can can get answers to those questions and stay abreast of, of you know current and topical issues and changes and in thinking in the industry um, i think the, the the groups that we've brought together today uh, including the firewise council uh, your local fire department um, the clca um, is is interested in in uh moving this issue forward and maintaining it as well. So um, I think those are the those are the places that I that I'd look. Great. Okay, another question we had is when the soil is well hydrated underneath a I think it's a three foot arbor or three inch <laughs> arbor mulch layer, that'd be a lot, three feet, uh, is the mulch as likely to ignite from embers? So if the soil is well hydrated, is the mulch still as likely to ignite? I think Marco is the most qualified person, but um, I'm going to answer yes. <laughs> the surface, particularly in windy situations when it's hot, dry, low moisture, just because the ground underneath it is is moist and the mulch is maintaining um, the moisture levels for the root zone, the surface I think is very still uh, susceptible to to combustible. To combusting. Let's see another question we had is who is the most appropriate qualified person to visit a property to assess its hardening and firewise status. And Marco? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, so we're prepared for that in our fire district. And um, so I would normally say fire service, but it would depend on who you're speaking to and are they, they actually, have they done some work and are they prepared for it? Um, with the FireWise, um, it would definitely be starting at the Fire Safe Council in your county, would lead you to the right people and someone within the fire departments that would have the, that they've worked with that would be able to be spot on with those. Does that help? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Another question is, uh, is there a concern with the use of more compost wood alternatives um, being used to replace wood? So uh, kind of mulch alternatives. I'll, do, I'll start with that. Um, something to be aware of is the uh, Board of Forestry, who is responsible for establishing the um, um, Cal Fire's standard for defensible space, the 30 foot zone, the out to 100 foot, and then they're working on the five foot ember resistant. The current proposed standard for that'll go into effect next year is no, no mulch within 30 feet of homes is what they're pursuing right now. So just to be aware of that part. Does someone else have more details specific towards um, answering this question other than I, I like the non-combustible mulch or the rock that were that was very good so who's next um, let's see if nobody else wants to comment on that one I have another question um, this one I think will be for Martin or Phil um, and this is is there a link or a list available for the higher water content plans I think succulents were an obvious one but perhaps the less obvious ones 
I would have to say there's no actual list. I mean, it's kind of relative depending on season and species. So um, we know succulents by definition have water in their leaves and stems and are less prone to burn. Although of course, you know, if you know, the CZU complex, there's somebody posted a picture that was amazing of a bed of ice plant that had actually burned, which will show you fire intensity because where, there, where there's organic matter and the right temperature, and conditions, anything will burn. However, um, things are relatively less fire prone um, based on their water content and of course the other environmental conditions. But there's, there's no simple list. To add to what Martin said, part of that would be ice plants notorious because it doesn't get maintained. It builds up a layer underneath mm -hmm. and um, you have the succulent on top, but you have this bed underneath. So it becomes a um, an ember um, capable bed of burning. It doesn't have a high intensity fire, but it skunks around, it moves around and it um, can lead to something that could add intensity. And Marco, we've got another one for you. Um, how likely is it that firefighters would use rainwater harvesting, uh, rainwater harvesting system to fight a fire? And uh, if they would, how large of a cistern would you need to make it worth using? So we have a standard in Sonoma County, Sonoma County, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I used to work for Sonoma County, for um, Santa Cruz County for emergency water supplies. And it's a standard that um, all of our fire districts follow. So if you had a reservoir of water that was attached to this hydrant and it was placed in a location and identified with blue reflectors, we would we'd be able to use that. Let's see. Oh, here's a fun one. Um, do you have recommendations for monthly or quarterly maintenance after the use of goats to mask masticate dried vegetation and ladder fuel? Who's that for? <laughs> Maybe Phil. I, mean, I don't know. I, I well, I think monthly and quarterly maintenance is a relative is a relative thing, and I think the underlying issue is to try to minimize, reduce, and eliminate. Um, any any fuel sources uh, for the fire. So, um, you know, you definitely would would want to look at that and um, you know continue with that with that goal in mind. Um, there's really no period. It's more of just an ongoing effort and continually being vigilant about um, reducing fuel and fuel beds around the home. With using goats, the fact we've communicated with goat people before, and they're interested in having a multi-day project. So it would be having a pen, it's electrified, the goats work here, they adjust it and keep moving it as the goats make progress. But transporting the goats to the site is very challenging. So if you have enough goats to actually make good progress on it, having them there for several days um, helps the cost of um, uh, bringing them out. And here's, these are kind of in a similar uh, vein. They were earlier in the presentation and it was in regards to, um, Kind of balancing the need um, for vegetation after the the fires and and you know properties have been cleared out, um, and mitigating the risk of mud mudslides. So you know how do you balance the removal of leaf litter and plants, um, but still having a protective layer uh, for bare soil? I'll start with that one. The resource conservation district in each county and our, our resource conservation district is a great resource for residents for slope stability. And then over the years, the um, defensible space requirements have been trying to manage um, how to provide slope stability. And the standards in the past actually specified on a slope, you could have vegetation up to 18 inches tall, where um, if it's more level and dead grasses, you had to bring it all the way down to four inches. Um, in the link that I provided, and I can post that again, so it'll be more towards the top. I put in some um, uh, references that are available for slope stability. Anyone else have comments for that topic? No, okay. I think we've got two more questions that I've seen. Um, is tree health something that we should consider in our home hardening efforts? Any takers? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, let's see. And not, then... I'm not sure. I think, you know, tree location, tree health. Yeah. I mean, if you have a, a dead dying tree close to other trees, again, just focus on the, the source of fuel um, for the fire. So, um, yeah, I think creating separation between trees and all plants is, is one of the goals here. And if you have a dead tree close by to a bunch of other things, um, then by all means, uh, that should be taken into consideration. And and then I, would just, last... I would just add to that and say yes. Um, if, if somebody can assess the tree health, uh, will help decide which vegetation to remove, uh, solving two problems at once. We get a lot of calls from the in the fire service for there's a dead tree, and it's and it's a log that's just standing upright, and as long as it's not close to a house, the amount of energy that it would take to actually get that tree to start to burn, everything would be on fire already. So it's not like it's going to add to fire intensity, but share that different to I, I went out yesterday to the um, Freedom Fire that we had, and there was a spot fire that. Um, was a quarter mile or so away near Nuns Road. And there's probably 10 um, 80 foot, 90 foot redwood trees with all dead leaves. That's a high risk. So you've got those leaves standing in place. Um, pines are notorious for not dropping their needles and they're standing and that's a torch ready to go. So that would be extreme risk. Compare that to leaves and those types of things on a tree uh, that fall and then you would end up um, reducing the risk by limbing um, the lower branches and nothing underneath it that could add intensity. So these trees that I'm referring to in, in um, near freedom, what, what we're gonna do is ask the residents to limb up as high as you possibly can, reduce the fuels underneath it, so that way a surface fire doesn't have enough intensity to get up into it. But it's gonna be a difficult job and we'll see if those trees survive when it was just the, um, um, the surface skin that was damaged. I think there was one other question and that was, what is the best practice for storing firewood? The uh, best practice for storing firewood is not near your house. The uh, defensible space requirements specify that they should be at least 30 feet away. And then they identify um, putting a non-combustible tarp over them. The, the problem with, with um, firewood is it's all this surface area and ember could land in there. And if you had a surface fire that can get to it, it adds a lot of intensity. So it's a great way to get a tree to burn is burn the wood pile underneath the tree. And then that energy is gonna go up and burn into the tree. Um, I've been sharing with people an idea that the high intensity fire concern that we have in this area is when we get our Northwest winds. And so September, October in particular, that you wouldn't wanna have that wood pile in alignment with your house. And it'd be nice if you didn't put that wood pile in alignment with someone else's house. But I've seen structures that people have built like a little shed um, out of non-combustible material. So that way they kind of isolate it. Um, I remember um, Yanni from um, UC came and did one of our home hardening um, discussions. I like what she had said. And a reality is they've got a cabin and they've got wood and she leaves it on her porch in winter when nothing is going to burn. They're not at risk of a wildfire, but as you get into um, um, at-risk season, she increases the level of attention to it. And I like that strategy. Uh, and there's a couple questions about um, assistance programs or how to have neighbors um, and folks clear out their properties. Um, I know, I think Liz Ann Jensen from the Firewise uh, Council mentioned that there, there are some funds um, for that. Um, but what, what are your recommendations for, you know, ensuring that neighbors <laughs> are being neighborly? I'll start with that. From fire service, we're trying to identify a source specifically for that and then residents that are at risk. And what we've seen is elderly couple or uh, people in their forever house, one um, partner is lost and then family members are further away. And it's very common that they seem to be left on their own. Um, we've been working with residents in um, some of the road associations and it would also fit in with the firewise of knowing your neighbors and knowing who these people are and who's at risk and then we might be able to find a source to help do the defensible space potentially offset some of the costs so it would be um, looking for grants and maybe that would be something we can focus in towards the um, fire safe council of 
a source for our at-risk population. Um, in, in Santa Cruz County, we've got a new Office of Resiliency. That's one of the issues that we're we're bringing as the fire service we see these situations is there someone that we can refer them to and and help channel some resource to help and um, then working with the neighbors to be in in touch with their um, residents and neighbors any other ideas for that one well you know the the uh, the clca locally does about um two or three community um projects and if there were some you know, particularly at need, at risk people, um, I think I could certainly bring it to the board to consider marshalling our resources. We get a couple of employees from all the companies um, and we go we go tackle big projects like this. So um, feel free to reach out to me if you have some specifics of people that you know, um, and we'd definitely be happy to, to see what we can do. From the fire service, what I've been trying to do is um, establish a mechanism where I'm gonna certainly take advantage of that, but maybe I'll channel that through the Fire Safe Council so that way other fire districts would be able to get in touch with the Fire Safe Council, then we'd be able to refer that from them to you. So it would be um, kind of a, a vetting process in a way. Sure, that'd be great. That'd be a great way of dealing with that. Um, this is Liz Aon from the Fire Safe Council. And right now, funding is rather scattershot for trying to find somebody who can help uh, help your community do the work necessary. Um, with COVID right now, a lot of the funding for this at the state level is going to try and get COVID under control. But the governor recognizes the high priority of getting communities involved in um, making their areas more fire safe. So in the future, I think there's going to be a more coordinated funding uh, mechanism in place. I think it's going to, it has been delayed by COVID, but it is a recognized need and will be coming. So right now, there's not really one place we can send people to look for funding. You kind of just have to see what you can find, but hopefully that will change in the next couple of years. Thanks. I think those were all of the questions we had. Hey, well, thank you, everybody. It, it's really been a, a, a great, great um, presentation by everybody. A lot of a lot of good minds on this, on thinking, on the, the best thinking on this topic. And yeah, so thanks for joining us today. All right, all right. and we'll, uh, we'll follow up with a link to the recording and uh, I think some slides, folks are asking about slides, so. Try to pull that stuff together in the next week and uh, and distribute to the registrants. Okay, thanks everyone. Have a good weekend.